Keller, I'm Assistant Director at Sacramento Public Library. And today I'd like to welcome you guys to, to a presentation on Perf Sonar, or what's new in Perf Sonar. Today we have some really uh, fun speakers for you today. We're going to have Eli Dart, Brian Tierney, uh, Celeste Anderson, and John Hess. Um, this is an interactive presentation, so if any of you guys have questions, we're more than happy to answer them. So without any further ado, here's Brian. So yeah, hi everybody, I'm Brian Tierney from ESNet. Um, for those who don't know, ESNet is the organization that connects all the uh, US Department of Energy laboratories together, as well as uh, connection to CERN in Europe. Um, so I'm gonna give uh, about a half hour talk, just sort of uh, update on what's going on with PerfSonar. It kind of assumes you've heard PerfSonar talks before. I imagine that's not quite true, so I'll try to give some intro. Uh, and then we have three or four people from the scenic community who use Perfsonar. They'll come up at the end, talk a little bit about how they're using it, what they like about it, maybe what they don't like about it, and, um, and then open it up for questions. So I'll just jump right in. Um, so uh, what is Perfsonar? So Perfsonar is an open source network monitoring tool that uh, helps uh, you uh, raise the network performance expectations of your users. The idea is you set up regular background monitoring and um, present those results to your users to say, this is what my network's capable of. Uh, and then it also has tools to help find and hopefully fix problems in the network, uh, in particular what we call soft failures. And I'll go into some more details on that. Uh, and particularly all in multi-domain environments. There's a lot of commercial tools out there that work fairly well within a single domain environment within your network, um, but there's really nothing, there's very little out there that works cross domains. Uh, and the longer the distance of the networks, the more these are, uh, the, the, the more the problems can be uh, amplified. And the Persona also just provides standard ways to collect and publish um, network monitoring data, which can be really useful to network researchers as well. Um, so who, who is Persona targeted at? Uh, fundamentally, it's targeted at network performance engineers, people whose job it is to make sure their networks go fast, um, wide area network operators such as Scenic, such as ESNet, uh, to help make sure that the network is performing as, uh, as expected. And then it's also targeted at distributed data managers, big science projects, things like the, the telescope in Chile that, uh, that Larry mentioned, where um, there are people in charge for moving data around. Um, LHC is another classic example of that. Um, just to make sure that people are clear, PerfCenter is not aimed at end users. Um, and it, it's largely because there's a lot of sort of, um, sort of an art to really digging into network performance problems. I know there's several people in this room who, who have dealt with this kind of stuff and understand this. Finding that, that a problem exists is relatively easy with the right tools. Finding the cause of that problem can be extremely hard. And you know, PerfSonar is not about to claim that it solves that problem. It's, it's still basically a tool for uh, expert network performance engineers. Uh, and of course, the more PerfSonar hosts there are along the path, the easier it is to, to isolate where the problem might be. So one of the big values of PerfSonar is it uh, includes a, a dashboard feature, so you can set up meshes of tests to verify um, the paths you care about are clean. Um, this, this dashboard happens to be all green, but uh, you can color code your, your paths as green, red, or yellow based on whether it's performing as, as you expect. And in general, you set up your test to run four to six times a day. And if you get three or four tests in a row with bad performance, your dashboard will turn red or yellow. And um, we run lots of uh, dashboards at ESNet, that, that URL. You can go look at all of our dashboards. It's all publicly available. Scenic has a dashboard. A lot, a lot, of, a lot of folks have dashboards. Um, so this is a really just useful way to, to keep track of the health of your network and, um, again, uh, raise, hopefully raise performance expectations, saying, look, we're getting 10 gigs from here to there, including halfway across the country or across the planet. So currently there are about 1,600 uh, publicly registered PerfSonar servers uh, around the world, probably an equal number that don't register themselves in our global lookup service. Um, 
it doesn't necessarily mean you can run tests to them. Sometimes people put added restrictions on their hosts. Um, but a, 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 I would say at least half of these servers anybody can run a test to. Um, ESNet has maybe one of the largest numbers of hosts. We have about 70, including one 40 gig host. Jayant in Europe has 22. Internet 2 has three, one on both coasts and one in the middle of the country. And, and then a whole lot of regionals run several as well, including, I think last I looked, Scenic has five. Does that sound right? Functional, <laughs> Functional and pub public ones too, right? Yeah, so stuff that anybody, any Scenic member can run a test to, right? Yeah. Uh, so the, the term persona kind of encompasses a, a lot of software, a lot of different things. There's a set of low-level measurement tools that includes things like um, iPerf, BWCTL uh, is a tool for running and scheduling tests. OAMP is a tool for measuring loss and latency and jitter, trace routes, et cetera. Uh, there's an archive component that collects the results from your tests and um, publishes them. There's host management tools to make sure you're the, um, the, the, your persona host is properly tuned, has a proper um, NTP config on it, et cetera. And then there's a bunch of tools to um, do plots and the dashboards and things like that. Uh, historically, Persona was distributed as what we called a toolkit, which was literally a, um, a, a boot DVD or USB drive or whatever uh, that would install CentOS operating system and install the components. It was sort of an appliance mode. Um, but now we bundle it in all sorts of different ways and you can install all these different uh, components uh, independently. So one of the key things uh, behind Persona is this notion of hard failures versus soft, soft failures. Uh, hard failures are, are easy. They're the kind of things that every networking organization is good at finding. You know, it's like when ping doesn't work, you know, a fiber cut, power failure, the hardware ceases to operate. It's the network just stops working. Um, there's a lot of tools out there that do that. Most networks are good at that. Um, there's, but soft failures are a totally different category where Things work, they just work a lot slower than they should. And often people don't even know why. People, for one, they don't know what it should work even means. Um, and second of all, they don't know why. So Persona is good for trying to figure out cases where um, these soft failures exist. Um, I like this set of slides just for fun. This is an example of a hard failure almost happening. It's a shark attacking an undersea fiber cable. Uh, they're just cool pack. So it appears that he didn't succeed, as far as I can tell. But <laughs> so that's not really what Persona is about. Persona is about um, a different class of failures. And um, here, here's an example of one that this was actually uh, a, a real case from ESNet about, I don't know, six or seven years ago now, where we had a failing piece of hardware that was dropping one out of every 22,000 packets, right? Not very much, 0.0046% packet loss. And um, just be, due to the, TC, the, the dynamics of the TCP protocol, over a really high latency path, like sending data from California to, to uh, Europe, that's a huge, huge, huge impact in performance. That, you know, one out of every 22,000 packets will quickly, um, really really cause a huge um, performance issue. So this is a case where everything worked, and in fact, not very many packets were dropped, but it, it led to a huge performance problem. Um, here's another example of soft failures where we had some gradually failing optics that were slowly dropping more and more packets, and then you see where things get repaired. So it never stopped working, right? The network never broke. It just got slower and slower and slower and slower. And um, unless you're doing this type of monitoring, um, you'll never see it. Uh, another example here is a firewall uh, that was just really horribly underpowered. So one direction, everything, the firewall was looking at all the packets and caused performance to be down here. Uh, the other direction, outgoing through the firewall, was fine. So unless you're doing that sort of monitoring through your firewall, you're never going to see that. So the, the core key tool inside of uh, Persona is called BWCTL, stands for bandwidth control, although it's used for a lot more than just bandwidth now. It's a historical name. Um, 
And you can run tests between any two percenter hosts. Um, anybody can. This is all publicly available. You can install BWCTL on your laptop, and as long as you're connected to, uh, to Eduroam, for example, here at the conference, every, anybody could do this right now if they wanted to, run this test, doing a bandwidth test between these two persona hosts uh, using the iperf 3 tool. Uh, you can do pings, you can do trace routes, trace paths, uh, OAMP is the delay loss tool. So it's a really powerful tool that lets you run a test between any two points um, and, uh, and collect the data. And then the, the perf center toolkit then automates all this so you can control when it's run and put it all in an archive. So just quickly, it's a little bit of Persona history. So Persona can trace its origins to an Internet 2 uh, initiative called the End-to-End -End Performance Initiative in the year 2000. So it's been over 15 years now. Um, so what's changed since 2000? Um, so, so TCP has gotten better. I don't know if folks remember back then. This was before Cubic and um, before auto-tuning, and, and things were really, really, really hard to get TCP to work well way back then. Um, so, you know, some things are better. Uh, we have better tools now to do parallel transfers with things like Clovis. There's some, also some neat commercial tools that use UDP transfers like Aspera. Uh, and then even more recently, there's a bunch of uh, new TCP stack changes in Red Hat 7.2, which came out last December, and Debian 8, which came out uh, a couple years ago. I actually have some slides at the end of the talk that show some of those improvements. So things are getting better, but the bad thing is, uh, uh, there, there was a, a term coined by Matt Mathis a long time ago called the wizard gap, the difference between what a network wizard could get out of the network and what an average person could get out of the network. And fundamentally, that's still pretty large, especially with projects like PRP and doing 40 gig hosts and 100 gig hosts. You still need a lot of wizardry at that level. Um, there's still a lot of network hardware out there that's underpowered, and soft failures often just go undetected for months because people don't know to look for them. So a bit about Persona collaboration. ESNet is just one of four major partners in the project. It's led by ESNet, Internet2, Indiana University, and Jayant in, in Europe. Each organization has committed uh, one and a half FTEs to the project, which is uh, roughly one FTE of developer and a half an FTE of other uh, folks like me who come and give talks like this. Um, and then there's also, though, a lot of help from others in the community. It is an open source project, and we do get people committing code and patches, et cetera. Um, the Persona roadmap is influenced by the community. It's talking to folks at, at conferences like this, figuring out what they need. Um, and um, we try to put out a new release every year or so. Um, Persona really kind of does um, need dedicated hardware. Uh, the whole idea behind Personar is you have a controlled test environment so you know that only one test is running at a given at, at, at one time but uh, hardware costs have really come down these days you can get a good 1u host capable of, of pushing a full 9.9 .9 gigabits per second of TCP for around $500 um, now of course the the 10 gig NIC is going to cost a lot more than $500, so, and then the 10 gig port to plug it into, so it's a little bit more than that total, but still the basic host is only about $500. And if you only care about a 1 gig host, you can get a pretty good host these days for $150. There's a bunch of new things coming out in, that are Intel Celeron based hosts. Um, some, some folks experimented with this uh, Zotac box at Supercomputing last year and had a lot of experience with it. There's some other folks who are using something called Oliva X, uh, but there's a bunch of things in the $100 to $150 range that are Celeron based that um, make a good persona host. There are also people playing around with really cheap ARM based things like Raspberry Pi, um, but we don't really recommend that. And in general, VMs aren't recommended because it's again, it's, it's all about isolation and you can't really guarantee NIC isolation in a VM in general, but there are, there are use cases for VMs with persona as well. So the, um, the most recent release of Persona was version 3.5 that came out last October, um, where we, uh, that was the first time we supported things beyond CentOS. We now support Debian. Um, we have some support for VMs. We have support for low-cost nodes. The low-cost node world is mostly a Debian world, so that was important. Um, 
and again, we expanded our use cases beyond this toolkit notion where you install everything at once to you can install different bundles. Uh, and a big focus was on the ability to do central management. Um, so it's for folks who want to manage a, a wide um, persona deployment. Um, for example, um, I think maybe I have this on another slide, but um, the folks who run the uh, RNE network in Kansas, it's called CanRen, they're very interested in putting a persona host at every K-12 school in the state, right? And they want to manage it centrally. So they, they, they have a 1,000 schools, I think, in Kansas. So imagine the, the notion of trying to manage a 1,000 of these um, persona hosts. Uh, I'm not saying we have all the software to do that yet, but we've, we're heading down that path. And um, I think by the next release, hopefully, we can do things like that. Um, but there are a number of campuses who want to manage um, a bunch of nodes centrally, uh, including in net networks like ESNet and CNET want to do that sort of thing as well. Um, so I think I'm going to skip over some of this to make sure we have more time at the end. But yeah, again, we have these different persona installation options. I mean, one is just the tools which I actually recommend everybody just install everywhere. They're, they're useful tools to have just on all your hosts. And it's just a simple yum install percenter tools. Um, but then there's other packages that add more and more uh, features, the ability to be part of a mesh, um, and then the ability to run a central management archive, things like that. So there's a bunch of different uh, installation options now. Uh, Persona is actually also quite useful for network researchers. Um, there's APIs to query the data from the archive and do various analysis on it. There's a few different projects um, that are NSF funded that are doing uh, research on network, on Persona collected data. So I mentioned the notion of these $150 nodes. So you know, a big motivation for that is to allow organizations to consider deploying uh, Persona at scale. Um, also, just the idea of having, I mean, so these nodes are really small, right? So you can throw them in your backpack. If you're a network engineer trying to do some troubleshooting, you can carry it down to the wiring closet, plug it in, and then run some tests. Um, makes it really useful for that kind of thing. Um, but, but we do want to point out that Persona is not really designed to be a LAN monitoring tool. That's sort of a different design space. There's a bunch of commercial products in that space. They put it at, at the LAN level, you probably need better timekeeping than NTP provides. So there's a, there's a number of reasons that I'm, I'm not yet convinced that you'd want to deploy 100 of these on a single campus. But 100 of them scattered around the state at every K-12, that's, that's a different story, which I think is actually quite useful. And the low-cost nodes might be a way to do that. Uh, so what are we working on now? So it's sort of the, uh, the, um, the themes for the future release are what we're calling control and scalability. Right now, in general, um, you bring up a person on our node and anybody in the world can test to it, which is really useful because anybody in the world can test to it. But, um, but it also has, um, it also makes some people nervous and can be a problem because sometimes too many people test to it. Yeah, in fact, ESNet has a couple cases where some of our nodes are getting too popular right now. So um, the next version will allow a lot more controls over how many times a day somebody can test to you, what times a day somebody can test to you, how long a test can they run, all those sorts of things. Um, which you know, as as Percenter grows and becomes more popular, these are the these are the sorts of issues you run into. Um, Right, so we're going to have this new scheduler called uh, PS Scheduler. Um, we're also working on some new graphs that are much more intuitive. Uh, there will be a web interface for creating test meshes. If anybody's tried to do that before, they know it's fairly tedious config file that's easy to get wrong right now. The next version will have a GUI for that. Um, we'll have full CentOS 7 and Debian 8 support, and then we'll have some prepackaged uh, VM images as well for people who uh, need to run Persona in a VM, want to install it on Amazon, et cetera. So one, the, but the, the biggest change is we're getting rid of the tool BWCTL and replacing it with this new tool called 
P schedule or PS schedule, or I th I'm not sure we've decided on the name yet. Um, so that'll be a fairly fundamental change that's coming. Oh, and I, I probably should mention that the plan is to release this in roughly September. So the other thing that's really um, useful about Perf Center for, for researchers is there's these 1,500 nodes out there around the world that you can run tests to, which turns out to be really, really interesting. Um, there's people who are collecting topology data using these endpoints. Um, and uh, several people are starting to run TCP uh, stack experiments, in, in, including myself. I spent all weekend collecting data. Um, and uh, I thought I'd share some of that because it's pretty interesting. Um, so I, I, don't know if, I don't know how much people follow this stuff, but Google pushed out some TCP enhancements about two and a half years ago that are pretty significant. And they um, got picked up by Ubuntu right away, Debian uh, not too long thereafter, and finally the Red Hat world, they backported everything last um, December. They released it in, in CentOS uh, 7.2, Red Hat 7.2, uh, et cetera. And there's some pretty interesting differences. So here's, here's an example. That, uh, so this is just time um, running a TCP transfer. This is bandwidth. And the test is from Berkeley to Amsterdam, so it's a pretty long path. And under the old uh, version of CentOS, it took almost 25 seconds to fully ramp up to the 9.9 .9 gigabits per second. This is a nice, clean path. Um, with the new kernel, it ramps up in about four seconds. So pretty, pretty dramatic change. So if anybody's running data transfer nodes out there, you might want to think about upgrading. Um, and also added in this um, release, 7.2 release last December, is uh, something they call fair queuing, which was originally mostly designed actually for the lower end devices and to prevent buffer bloat and, and home networking. But it turns out it's pretty useful at the, at the high end as well. So here we have CentOS 6.5 in purple, standard 7.2 in green, and 7.2 with fair queuing enabled in blue. Um, fair queuing is off by default still. Um, so you see 6.5 and 7.2. In this particular case, it's slightly different dynamics. 7.2 again ramped up faster than 6.5, but actually hit a bigger loss event. So um, they, were, they were both um, about the same at the end of the day. But uh, with fair queuing, you get this nice, solid, perfect perfect graph. So um, this is all pretty new stuff. I've just started testing it. Uh, certain paths, it doesn't matter at all. Um, but I encourage people to, uh, who are into this sort of stuff to start looking into it and, uh, and playing with it. But uh, it does seem to make a, a really big difference. But it, but it was so useful for me to do these sorts of testing to have these persona nodes out there that I could test to. You know, this random University of Chicago host that I found that exhibited this uh, behavior that I was able to test against. Um, Without Persona, I would have only been able to test to ESNet hosts, which and you know which are much cleaner paths and much less interesting paths um, for this sorts of thing. So just a couple final slides. So um, there's a pretty strong Persona community. I, several of the community members are in this room. Um, there's an active email list. Um, so we encourage you to uh, join the list if you're not already. Um, and I've got a, a bunch of uh, URLs here at the end. Hopefully most of you know about the Faster Data website. That's a website that I created about 10 years ago that's grown and grown and grown and grown. Um, we call it a knowledge base with anything to do with network, uh, network performance, science DMZs, data transfer nodes, you name it. Um, there's lots and lots of information on Faster Data. Uh, and we encourage people to help us keep it updated as well. Okay, so I, I'm going to stop there and take some questions, and maybe the panelists can come on up. So, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned uh, uh, perhaps distributing the tool or whatever. Does Persona have any NAS reversal? Uh, in the <laughs> uh, 
Yes, yes, yes. So uh, um, Jim asked if persona plans include uh, support for NAT traversal. Uh, we looked into that, and it's a lot of work. It's the, the, the underlying tools that we depend on would really have to be rewritten from scratch, and it's, just, it's a really hard thing to do, uh, unfortunately. I mean, we understand that it's a, a, a lot of people would like that, uh, that fe feature. Mentioned the, the, you mentioned the uh, risks of the open architecture. I mean, have you, have you seen anyone attempt to use it as a probe of some kind or as a potential uh, vector for a, a DDoS attack of some kind? Uh, interestingly, no, never. Not to our knowledge. The possibility does exist. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, yeah. I mean, the, the, by default, it's fairly locked down. You can't do UDP tests. You can do a TCP test of maximum of 60 seconds. But sure, you could just fire off test after test after test. Um, but no, the answer is, no. and we do look for it, at least on our networks. We have, um, we have various tools that look for that sort of thing, and we've never seen it. Have you run into any um, finickiness or um, glitches with your NIC selection for the, uh, for the, for the, for the, for the nodes? Um, five years ago, for sure, um, but it seems like at this point, not as much. They've they've kind of all caught up. There, I mean, there there was a, yeah. I mean, most of those problems seem to have gone away. I mean, the, the, there are a few NIC specific tuning parameters, but you would kind of expect that, right? And so there's there's, and, and even there's some vagaries of some drivers. And, you know, now we're starting to see those issues at the 40 gig NICs, and then soon the 100 gig uh, NICs, yes. right? But at at the at, um, so it depends on how modern your hardware is. Yeah, there's a lot of war stories about, you know, capture cards. Yeah. Right, so. Sure, sure, yeah. Anything else? For those TCP enhancements that you were showing, you said available in CentOS 7, does that need to be on both? Both ends. Then? Just sender side, which is which is why I can do these sorts of tasks. Okay. Right. So it's okay. just sender side. Cool. Yeah. Okay. What are you guys going to do? Slides or just talk? Just. <laughs> and Celeste, aren't you supposed to be up here? She comes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I don't know who wants to go first. So, since we have somebody with slides, do you want to go first? <laughs> okay, so now um, we're doing that part two, and we're going to talk uh, about deployment cases and success stories. So, um, if you guys could just introduce yourselves real quick to the, pan to, to the audience. John Graham, I'm the uh, PRP um, FTE, the guy that's building the machines, and tuning the endpoints and you know, reporting. John Hess from Scenic and also working with John Graham and others including Eli on the Pacific Research Platform. Uh, my name is Eli Dart. I'm from uh, ESNet. I'm part of our science engagement group. Um, so um, Brian and I aren't actually in the same group but we work together quite a lot on performance engineering and, and, and other topics. I'm also I'm working, of course, with the, with the PRP folks and, and, and try to have my finger in as many performance pies as I can. And I'm Celeste Anderson. I'm the direct, Director of External Networking uh, at the University of Southern California. I also am the Director of Customer Relations for Pacific Wave. And in the second iteration of the Translate Pacific Wave grant, uh, we created a Translate Pacific Wave Persona support group, which has a mailing list and meets uh, once a month. And all of you who are interested are um, eligible to join in on the conversation. Great. All right. So, who wants to start off? Uh, all right. I'll start out. Everybody can see the. So uh, what I collected together uh, to do quickly is just some random uh, things. So in, with my multiple hats, 
Um, I'm going to give you an example in Los Netos that could be useful. Um, and then also I'm going to talk about USC CCNIE experience of putting that together and then a little comment about USC. So there's actually kind of like three different uh, ones that have deployed persona boxes. Um, so let's see, move forward. So the Los Santos use case I'm going to mention is kind of interesting. Los Santos was founded in 1988 and we've been going a long time and in order to be an associate or connect to the network, you have to have some kind of knowledge of networking. You run your own router and stuff. So our customers tend to be um, a, kind of a little bit more uh, tech savvy than the average one. So this particular case, uh, we had a customer who um, lives in Central California but has some servers located at Information Sciences Institute. And they've been loading in a ton of monitoring uh, software and we're seeing things that they thought were suspicious and that there was a bandwidth uh, uh, pro performance problem. And so one of our engineers said, gee, why don't you try uh, going to Personar instead of using speed test? And so the persons, I actually typed in the comment, um, they did say it was a little difficult installing the, the plugins and whatnot. But after running the test, they could clearly see that there was no network performance problem and they needed to look elsewhere to solve their problem. I'll also note that this particular customer has not complained of any issues like this since installing the Personar where because they can do their tests, they can see what is going on, and if they do uh, send in a report, then it's much more informed. So the reason I kind of brought this up is if you enable um, people who can do the testing to eliminate that it's a network problem, you're going to reduce the number of operational complaints of, could you look into this? I think there's a problem with the network. And statistically, it's usually not the network. It's usually something else. So this gives them a way of eliminating it. And if you've got a researcher who's late at night working on something, they can run the tests and go, oh, it's not the network. And so you're going to reduce the, the um, uh, calls to the knock or tickets being opened or maybe somebody delaying a response because they're waiting for you to get in the next day to find out whether there's some issue. Now, the caveat on this is it, it can't be just any user. Not it, as they were saying, Personar is not designed for an end user, so it has to be kind of a clueful end user on that side. So that's kind of perfect segue into the 10.2 network. Oh, oh, future Los Netos deployments. So uh, Caltech and JPL have Personar boxes, and we have done testing. When we brought up fiber links, we'll test to make sure that things are good. And, uh, and basically we have that ability, but Los Netos is planning on um, expanding to our other sites so we can do some regular uh, testing. Um, and I did mention that we hosted the first Persona Deep Dive, and I actually have four t-shirts left from this, so if you guys ask really good questions, you can walk away with a t-shirt today with this really cool submarine Persona logo thing. So anyway. That's just a, a carrot to ask some questions. <laughs> okay, so the 10-2 network was a CCNIE grant, and the idea was to create on the university infrastructure a separate science DMZ for the researchers, and each uh, lab or researcher would have a persona box connected nearby, and then they, the main one would be in the high performance computing cluster and they basically would use Personar to test the links as they came up and they created a mad dash. Um, they also had a component where they were doing um, uh, tests across to Clemson and actually in the early iterations of the 10-2 network, which won a, a scenic award, they actually got some of the first testing across internet too at 80 gigabits per second during uh, their early tests. And this is just what they started out with of kind of the idea of how they would have this connected. And then, oops, here we go. And then here's a more detailed one of how the cluster was and how each of the sites would be. And what's missing in these pictures is where the persona boxes were, but there was one per site. 
Um, so uh, one thing that was interesting is we were testing to Berkeley uh, because on, in, on behalf of the Deter Project, which was one of the ones we were doing, and we noticed some issues. Berkeley took a look, said, yep, there's something going on, was able to reboot the presenter box, and the error stopped. So you actually can help other networks find problems if you're testing to them regularly that they might not have noticed. So there's a community benefit to, oh, by the way, you know, we were pre-testing to see something and we discovered something so we can iron that out before we really need it. So that's extremely useful. Um, we verified a link before um, we got another NSF grant, uh, Richard Weinberg, to actually teach a STEM class in Chattanooga from USC. Uh, there's a really cool video on it. He put a 4K video camera onto one of the expensive uh, microscopes at USC and a marine biologist taught the class and they created these controls. Well, you can imagine the classes are gonna happen at a regular schedule, that link better be solid. So basically they were using Personar to pretest and work out all the issues before the class actually happened. So that's a, another use of having those. Um, and then during SC15, a lot of people in this room do a lot of testing on Persona to find issues uh, while they're doing that, including a lot of our international partners. So that's a big component of that for the research people. Um, so some of the issues that we had in USC is NTP timing where stuff was moved behind a firewall or something got changed in the environment and all of a sudden stuff's out of sync. So you need to be paying attention to that. Labs can move equipment and not tell you and all of a sudden stuff isn't working because you're not there. So uh, you need to basically have that under monitoring. And then as always, almost all of us working in higher ed do not have sufficient IT staff to track everything. So that's one of the comments I'm gonna make uh, at the end is about how to operationalize the experience. So there is a mad dash that gets created, so each of you can do that within your campus. And one of the things I should mention, uh, Brian, is that a lot of the nodes are kept secret internally and not to the, the public. You basically have one outward facing or maybe a couple. So they're not all appearing on the global registry because you're doing it for your own monitoring within your own site because you basically don't want a zillion people testing to every node you've got on campus. Um, and so currently we're doing a handoff from the HPC group to the operational uh, networking group to maintain this. And so one of them is we need to put it in monitoring tools, we need to know the stuff is up, and we need to set stuff up. So there's things that the CCNIE basically did, and then as soon as the grant was over, now they're not doing it, and oops, no one's doing it, so another group needs to pick it up. So you do need to have a proper transition. And then uh, USC actually was doing testing to their DR site. So found some issues with that connection as well. So if you have disaster recovery, you're gonna wanna make sure that that site's up and operational and that those issues are ironed out. And then the, the new piece, which goes into that kind of VM, and I was actually asking the group about a question, is more and more people wanna have some kind of like virtual persona or piece they can stick to test the cloud service. Um, and so we've actually, um, I got word that JPL has something for testing to AWS and Carl was mentioning he may have a solution. So I'm looking forward to that in our uh, discussion. But we did find in our testing that despite AWS and a lot of the other ones saying that they're not rate limiting, you can clearly see from the graphs that they're just right there capped at like 50 meg or something and you're never gonna be able to test that you can actually do it if they don't iron out how you can actually get your testing tools to show that they basically have the capacity to handle what they say they're going to be able to do in the cloud. Uh, mentioned uh, resources, there's uh, perfclub.org which is, uh, supports the, the uh, group that I talked about and anybody who wants to be on the mailing list can let us know. Those of us uh, in the scenic uh, HPR TAC, there's a CCNIE call that talks about Personar as well as science DMZs and DTNs and 100 gig deployments. There's an OIN uh, that's Operating Innovative Network 
uh, workshops that are offered that are fabulous. If you can send people, th those are great. And then from time to time, you'll find a Personar deep dive, which is for people who've already deployed Personar and go even further into how to use the tools. So fasterdata.es.net, personar.net is the main website, um, and any of us can give probably additional resources. Thank you. Great. Who'd like to go next? So for, as Celeste was mentioning, there's a number of use cases within Scenic. We have maybe a, a collection of past and current and developing use cases. So when Brian was asking, well, how many personar boxes does Scenic currently have deployed? I was, I laughed and I said, well, five functional, because we still have, I guess, legacy machines were, where we had a perhaps an individual contributor who was very interested in the technology at that point. We deployed about, thank you, deployed about 10 boxes. And uh, since then, some have through benign neglect may have fallen off the radar. Um, so where we have now are uh, mostly a collection of one gig connected per sonar boxes and two connected to HPR at 10 gig. And so in, we are in the middle of a per sonar refresh where we're deploying modern hardware that will be 10 gig connected. Um, whereas previously we may have deployed separate machines for BWCTL versus OWAMP uh, services, those functions are now combined into one machine on se but separate network interface cards. Um, one differentiating point that we're in the coming deployment is that we're splitting off uh, services for NDT use that uses a separate congestion uh, control algorithm than, um, as Brian was describing with iperv3, using Cubic. The, just to keep those from uh, colliding and skewing test results. So within Scenic, our NOC uses the uh, Personar tool set for ad hoc testing. In some cases, we've uh, prepped a notebook with the Personar toolkit and shipped it out to a remote site so that, again, that either that the, there was a wizard gap on the remote site in terms of setting up the Personar or being able to uh, assist us in interpreting the results. Um, the, the, it is of interest to us, uh, as Brian and others are mentioning, the uh, low-cost uh, personar nodes. It would be something that, again, in the, in the uh, scenario of having 1,100 plus libraries uh, connected, that maybe that is something that we can consider a at, an at-scale deployment of, of those nodes that we can help um, isolate failures, hit, see the soft failures and performance issues. So the, one of the other use cases that Scenic is supporting is, and uh, John Graham will discuss more, is in Pacific Research Platform. That um, effort, again, the, as Celeste mentioned, one of the things that uh, ESNet and Internet2 have contributed to are the Personar deep dive sessions. So the, at a Personar deep dive that uh, USC hosted in January of last year was sort of kind of the kickoff for the Pacific Research Platform project and um, going in deep into the test cases for Personar as well as standing up a proof of concept mad dash that we since have come to uh, get a lot of mileage out of. And then kind of looking toward the future, uh, Dave Reese earlier mentioned the Pacific Wave and the IRNC grant that we're uh, doing for expansion within the West Coast as well as the regional, Western region of the United States and into Tokyo. So as part of that grant, we are looking at uh, deploying personar nodes directly onto the Pacific Wave exchange points, initially in Seattle and Los Angeles, in year one activities. Uh, year two will include Sunnyvale, and we are also considering um, uh, we are developing 100 gig connected nodes for two of those locations initially. And then looking forward, uh, considering other locations for uh, that high speed uh, persona deployments, including Tokyo and uh, perhaps at Chicago. 
Great. Uh, John, would you like to give us a little update? Okay, great. Um, this wire won't fit my computer. <laughs> got a converter. I just happen to have a converter right now. Good, perfect. Let's see what we got here. I've got. Do you need HDMI? Yeah. I've got HDMI right there. Thank you. Okay, I need to gather my windows. That's how you fix it. Sometimes. <laughs> no. Well. Nah. Yeah, I thought they were, but. Oh, oh. it's fine. I can grab another one if you need to. It should be. Yeah, there it goes. I uh, should be on edge room. Okay. All right. So um, one of the other things that the uh, Personar Tools provides is uh, the Esmond client that allows us to upload uh, the Personar, I mean, sorry, the, the Globus uh, grid FTP results into the, a MAD dash. So this allows us to do disk to disk testing and record the throughput of the entire system. And uh, this is actually a, a live dashboard so when you mouse over all these guys you can get the uh, the upload and download speed and if you click on one of these it'll drop you into a graph and this is an uh, indication of actually uh, the downturn here is when we dropped our layer 2 peering and then the uptick over here at the other end is when the HPR link came up so the HPR 100 uh, gigabit a second link so this is a nice way of monitoring the, the disk to disk throughput. One of the other really cool things that I've been playing around with for a while is the uh, Jupyter Hub. And uh, the uh, BWCTL command, uh, part of the PerSigner toolkit, has a dash dash parsable flag that will write out a JSON onto your file system. Then I uh, use a little bit of the Python code and we can pick up that URL and then plot that as a graph. And um, uh, typically, the, the JSON has multiple uh, objects in it, the, the retransmits and command buffer windows and things like that. They're all mashed together if you just you know, plot it on one. But with uh, subplots equals true, it splits them apart. And you can see all the different individual graphs. And my, my favorite one is the uh, send command window. You see all kinds of misbehaving uh, going on, uh, kind of correlated with uh, retransmits. So uh, uh, these tools, um, they're great, but sometimes you just need to do an ad hoc test and you know, create a report or you know, some publication for it. So having this integrated uh, into the uh, Jupyter Hub notebooks allows you to then use that data downstream in an ad hoc fashion instead of uh, doing it during regular testing. So, and uh, some of the other things that we've been doing, um, we've uh, deployed, a, uh, well, built, I'm not sure if they're quite uh, up uh, running yet, but UC Santa Cruz and UCLA have uh, received 100 gig uh, perf sonar DT uh, um, testers, and then the, uh, uh, we've been kind of building up the, the uh, the infrastructure for the, the older DTNs, uh, upgrading them and giving them you know, more capacity for SSDs on board. And, uh, and then we're refining our, our testing and, and uh, yeah, cleaning up reports. That's about all I have for this one. Okay, did we have anybody else who wanted to share some experiences before we open it up for questions? See, I guess, um, I guess there's, there's two things. One thing that um, that John just showed and, and that Celeste alluded to as well, and actually 
we've all sort of talked about a little bit, that I'd really like to put in a plug for um, the, the ability to capture um, test results over time, right, and, and see behavior over time. Um, you can you can find um, circuit failure event. I mean, especially for a backbone provider. Okay, you can you can find out when things got rerouted. You can find out when a link went bad. Um, it, it's it's really really useful to be able to. So, picture this, right? Some somebody files a ticket. They say, hey, something's busted or, or something's performing poorly. Whatever. You go and you look at it and you go, ah, okay. Well, eight hours ago something changed. Who touched what? Eight hours ago, right? And and it, be, just being able to narrow the time window for when something changed is hugely, hugely powerful. So um, bringing stuff up for ad hoc testing is it is really crucial as well. But but those long running tests give you a sort of forensic history that's really, really use, useful. I use it all the time. <laughs> it's re, it's really powerful. Um, so. I, I don't know if I want to name any specific instances. I think, in you know, in the interest of time, let's just open it up for questions. But but that set of features in particular is really really valuable. Okay. Uh, While well, we're getting towards the end of the session, so at this point, we're going to go ahead and open up to questions. Anybody may have. Got a question? Front. Hi. Um, you, you mentioned about the uh, use cases and deployment scenarios, and, and we have like 70 uh, locations and sites throughout California. Like there are research centers and uh, cooperative extensions. And I'm just wondering about the specific requirements as far as the scope and size, whether this is something that, that we could utilize. So, th th I mean, that's definitely the use, a use case we're targeting, but I don't know if anybody's done that yet, right, to, to actually centrally manage 70, 70 hosts. So we think it'll work, but nobody's tried yet. So, you know, we're, we're, we're actually looking for people who um, want to partner with us on sort of a, a trial deployment for that, for that scenario. Well, actually, uh, seven sites, but you know, we have the uh, resource centers. I think uh, are are the focus, and mm -hmm. we have around, I think, ten to fifteen of them. Yeah, well, that that should be no problem. Yeah. Questions. I've been looking at this product called Keynote for years. You know, it's a, I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. It's uh, they have sensors deployed throughout the tier ones, and they have it looks very similar. Does anybody know anything about? Um, that product as compared to the Berkman? Yeah, I don't. Does anybody? Keynote Systems? Yeah, they've been around for a long time. Okay. Any other questions? Got one up front. So, uh, somewhat in regards to the previous question, 70 by 70 mad dash grid is going to be kind of big. Uh, have you, how big can you go? Yeah, I mean, normally with that scenario, you, you'd pick like three, three by 70, right? You'd pick like three key notes and, and go out to every place, something like that. Okay. Um, but yeah, you, you definitely have to be careful of those sorts of things. Okay. And, and that's part of the reason we're adding all these additional controls to uh, the next version of personas. Because if people aren't careful, certain notes will get overwhelmed. One more. NDT, what, what are you gonna do with that? <laughs> Uh, do you want me to answer that first, or did you want to comment on the first? Response? Well, I, I had I had a comment on the on the first one. Yeah. Um, um, the 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 way you would want to deploy um, a sort of test mesh, if you will, um, often varies by tool. So if you if you go and look at the um, at the ESnet um, per sonar dashboard, um, you'll find one super gigantic. Um, mesh um, and a whole bunch of smaller ones. The super gigantic one is all OAMPs. It's not bandwidth tests, right? And then, and as, as Brian said, right, we have the bandwidth test broken out, broken out regionally. But when, once, once you start having a lot of personar nodes um, to use, you, it, it gives you the ability to, so I mean, you, you've got your network architecture in your mind, right? You, you know what the thing is supposed to do, how you expect it to be used, and where all the things 
the different pieces are. And so it allows you to then configure a long-running test environment to monitor that in any, in any sort of useful way um, that you would like. Um, and so you, it's, it's, use, it's useful to think about um, both in terms of um, monitoring the network architecture in, in this, a more functional way than just brute force, as you, as you described, um, but then also to, to um, go through that analysis on a per tool basis, because the result, the, the thing that's functional and useful um, is potentially different um, for different tools in a given network. Okay, and the NDT question. Um, yeah, I, I hate that question. <laughs> You'll note that I did not have NDT in my slide. So NDT stands for Network Diagnostic Tool. It's a historic personar tool that had been there from day one. But the problem is it's dependent on a Web 100 kernel. Web 100 isn't supported anymore. There was Web 10G for a while, and the funding for that ran out. Um, so the tool basically would need to be completely rewritten from scratch use a standard kernel, lose some of the functionality gain from 1 to 100. It's, it's a lot of work and we're trying to figure out um, who would do it. We're, we're looking for volunteers. <laughs> um, it's a good, good candidate for an NSF grant, maybe. Um, I think Celeste pointed out the exact reason we need such a tool, right? Speedtest.net doesn't help in, for certain circumstances. You need the speed test.net equivalent uh, in, on your campus. So um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it, it fulfills a valuable role and we have to figure out what we're going to do about it. Well guys, we have reached um, the end of time for our session. So um, we'd like to everybody give our wonderful speakers here a great round of applause. I think they did an excellent job.